Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, let's thank speaker again for this great talk. Um, so um, we, um, yeah, we, we can move to our last session of today's um, is the, 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 the final talk uh, delivered by uh, Mr. Matthew Leon. Um, Matthew, maybe you can share the screen with us now. Uh, so, uh, the, Mr. Matthew Leon serves as the director of Huawei uh, Research Center, Hong Kong Research Center, with the, the current focus in the development of hardware, software, and algorithm for artificial intelligence. Prior to that, he served as the director and a founding member of High Silicon Hong Kong R&D Center. His expertise and experience lies in the field of VRSI design for advanced communication chipsets, microprocessor, and artificial intelligence. Mr. Leo received his bachelor degree and master degree of electrical engineering in University of Michigan and Stanford University, respectively. Um, Matthew, I, I will pass time to you. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor. Um, <clears throat> Uh, is are you able to see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thanks, uh, Professor Yu, for uh, your generous introduction. So I'm Matthew. Uh, I run the uh, Hong Kong Huawei Research Center. And my, my background, like uh, Professor Yu mentioned, is more on the chip design. And uh, recently, um, interesting enough, I think recently there, there are a lot of, lots of uh, talks or news about our company. So I think that may make uh, this presentation more interesting. But uh, first, uh, let me make a disclaimer. I'm probably not um, uh, as uh, advanced as a technical person as most of you. So uh, today I'm going to talk more about the challenges itself. Well, I'm more like here to pose questions rather than giving solutions. So uh, let me just set the stage here. Um, okay, so. Okay, so let me just start out with a piece of news uh, or news cuts. Uh, again, I think this is one of the things that makes the talk a little bit more interesting is uh, the news nowadays keep talking about like how, how China can catch up with the, with the chip or, or, or the chip design work. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's, it's not just about China but uh, from my experience, uh, I used to work in a more uh, uh, established uh, IC company where we develop our own tools that like back in uh, like 10, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and the industry kind of changed since then uh, as the volume of chips goes up, uh, the, the third party EDA company becomes more and more um, uh, popular. Uh, because we need to support a lot more chip company to do things, uh, as well as we need to support a lot more tape outs. So those larger companies find themselves uh, not able to cope up with uh, the level of advancements in, um, in, in, in design automation development. So, so slowly, slowly, uh, this, all this third, third party uh, EDA company starts to gain much more advancement. Uh, and as a result, that gives rise to a lot of smaller uh, chip companies or younger chip companies like ourselves that we're able to benefit from the, uh, <clears throat> from the uh, uh, third party EDA tools. Uh, one, I think one very important part of, of this model is that um, we're able to decouple a lot of design work or many work into the EDA side uh, because we are able to do enough uh, abstractions on different levels. But uh, as part of the talk that I want to come to, um, as the more slows are slowing down, um, uh, we need to do, and we need to be able to meet the performance as need. As a matter of fact, I think, uh, for a lot of the companies, we've been relying on the Moore's law uh, in order to meet the performance we need for the customers. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, 
and as the Moore's law is slowing down, we need to look for new ways, uh, or more, new, more, more holistic ways, to make sure that we can have um, we we can able to meet the needs still. Uh, and the the part of separation that I mentioned about the this embankment uh, between the EDA companies and the chip companies and the manufacturer, uh, the chip manufacturer of chip fabrication. Uh, no longer is that convenient because you need to break all these walls or break this, all these uh, uh, <clears throat> borders to make sure that you can continue to have the performance we need. Um, so one part is uh, the more so is slowing down, so we, don't, we can no longer rely on, rely on that to, to, to get the performance we need. And the second part of it is uh, the, <clears throat> the that there are actually more requirements from customers uh, in order to fulfill the, the the need of the latest, like say, uh, consumer electronics. Right? You have this uh, old source of compute device from your handheld or even uh, for your wearables, all the way to uh, Mac, uh, <clears throat> Mac design, uh, Mac uh, data center. Um, so to fulfill all these requirements, you need like a different level of, level of customizations and just uh, uh, <clears throat> again cutting out some of the uh, uh, designs delivered by by uh, the ARM company that they are actually have you can see there's different a lot of more varieties even for the same processor that runs the same instructions they have like tens or dozens of variety of different processes to do that. Um, and in the same time, uh, the, the more complex uh, chip actually makes the, our design effort much more difficult, uh, not just on the front end side, we're having much bigger chips, but also on the back end side because of the advanced techno. Um, we used to have like a, a month uh, of back end work from the final lab list to GDS. Now for the most advanced techno, we need, we need at least four months. So, so, but then on the other hand, uh, customers want faster time to market, right? So the problem now is what ends up is, say for ourselves, uh, our engines work longer and longer hours. I don't know if it applies to some of our folks here, but for us, engines work longer and longer hours. So for my, for, for, for what we need to solve, actually, uh, I keep on making jokes to our colleagues, uh, for what we want to solve is actually how to make sure that we can uh, go home uh, uh, in, in the right time and, and feel happy, but not keep working over time. Um, so what are we proposing is uh, we try to have a high level framework uh, to make sure things can go on a more uh, automatic manner at the same time being to being able to achieve the difference or the harsher requirement on the different uh, uh, figure of merits like uh, power per uh, power performance area and time etc. So uh, there are uh, there are there are different aspects to that. And to start with, I think what we need now is a way to describe our design. Uh, we've been relying on Verilog. If you're a hardware designer, uh, we've been relying for on Verilog for almost 20, 30 years, right? So it, like and. Basically, since I, I'm out working, uh, I've, been, I've been using Verilog. And, and if you compare, that, compare this to the software world, where we moved from, I know back then in, in, in C or even earlier on Fortran, and then to C, C++, object-oriented language, right? And then to, to more scripting like, like, like uh, uh, Perl, Python, et cetera. So, so if you take the language as a, a type of productivity tools, uh, software guys move have been uh, like uh, five, six generation ahead of us while we're still stuck in Verilog. Um, so this is something that I think in order to be able to innovate, we have we need to have a way to be able to do a higher level of extraction of design. Uh, unlike some of the HDL or, or so-called HLS work that, that basically rely on C code, we probably want to have a better way to describe our design. Um, and the fact that is probably not just on the high level, but be able to do a mix or integrate a mix of different things 
all the way from the high level to uh, different extractions along the line until the final, final layout that which allows us to swap in or swap out blocks um, based on the level of details we want to describe. Okay, so that's something that I think we need. Uh, and second is uh, if we break the, the whole design cycle into two parts or three parts, uh, that's one part that we say, uh, we call it the design part, which is um, looking into the, the whole design space and see what's the optimal parameters or optimal configuration, configuration we need to do. And the other part is actually based on that parameter or based on that uh, configuration, we go ahead and do our design. So from, from that perspective, we call it automating the design and automating the coding. Uh, and for the design side, uh, we, we probably need a way to, again, describe the design space and then use certain elements to search for the best space for us. Uh, on the coding side, we probably need a way to, <clears throat> to do, uh, again, use different uh, abstraction of language level to do uh, to describe our design and some tools that can actually take out. Oh, we cannot see yes, the sorry. screen. We cannot see the screen. Oh, sorry. Um, let's okay, see. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, thank you. It, oh. it went away. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we can see your mouse. We can't see anything else. Uh, okay, that's annoying um let's see let me let me stop it and do it again um sorry I, so i've been talking to uh apologize um well we could see your mouse and we remember the picture so it wasn't too bad can, can you see the picture no or not, not yet. No, just lost. Okay. Um, apologize. It's not there. Uh, what about this? Yes. Now, now it's okay. It's design okay. challenge in post. Yeah, when you go to mode projection or... mode, it disappeared last time. So let's see. Okay, or maybe I just live in this mode. Mm. Probably easier this way. Let's see. Can you see? Can, can you see this uh, next screen? How to make customers happy? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I was on this slide already. So <laughs> apologize. Um, okay. So, uh, so this is uh, this slide that says a high level framework of what we need. So in case you can't see the slides, like just just ping, ping. So, um, so I was talking about this high level description language, how to make sure that we have a way to to do it different levels of extraction. And then I'm on the automated coding side, which is uh, how to make sure that we can have a streamlined design that allow us to uh, to do. Uh, different level of optimization because we don't always or or we have to uh, uh, <clears throat> live it live up to the reality reality that we might not to be able to do all everything on on the based on the high level description and do high level synthesis right so um, but but then again we do also think that we need a, a better high level synthesis tools to make sure that we can have a more streamlined coding coding um, and. And I mentioned about the, 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 the describing of the design space and also the actual coding, actual design. And at the end of the day, we will do the final implementation and layout. Um, and that's of course, uh, through the, the ordinary uh, synthesis space and route tools. And, and one of the part of that is uh, the output of that, we'll, we should go back and do a uh, correlation with, uh, with our original description of the design space because uh, this modeling might not be, uh, and oftentimes it's not as, accurate as we want. So um, the what we believe the, the important part of this is uh, if we put everything into this framework through uh, enough uh, data accumulation, uh, and that's a beauty of I think about machine learning is uh, with enough data, then, then we're able to continuously improve our cycle 
and that's something that we, we think um, uh, is important in the sense that uh, it, it basically puts all knowledge into uh, a, a tool instead of putting all knowledge into one's head, which would fade away sometime. Um, so taking down into deeper, uh, I'm going to talk about one each uh, different pieces uh, time uh, <clears throat> uh, through the talk. And first is on the on the description language. Uh, like I mentioned, I, we want to look into different levels of extraction. Uh, and we talk about processor, which is uh, the, the area that I'm more focusing on. Uh, I think it can be divided into different levels from the instru instruction level, more like the ISA level, so-called. Uh, uh, and to the micro architecture level, uh, how do you describe your pipeline and stuff? And eventually on the hardware description, it, it, with implementation to the actual circuit. So we do want to, to have a language that's able to do all this type of abstraction layer and be able to streamline um, the, the design of that, be able to swap in and swap out blocks as needed. Uh, and we, and we, if we look out to the, what we have, out there, I think one thing, um, one, uh, sorry. okay. So one, <clears throat> one where we uh, popular work or, or, or work that's uh, gathering a lot of attention is Chisel from uh, Cliff Berkeley. Um, But I apologize for that. So because I'm on this screen, I can't do the I can't do the, the animation. But anyway, um, uh, just a little bit of introduction on Chiso. Basically, uh, Chiso is a is a subset of Scalar, uh, string from Scalar, which is uh, special on way implementation. So um, the the good part of it is uh, it is actually comes from a more high level language, which is which is Scala. And the idea originally on that is uh, one can actually do simple uh, or more streamlined so-called hardware and software uh, <clears throat> uh, partition, uh, such that you take a, a Scala program and then you find something that you actually want to hardwire that, then then turn it into Chisel, and then you have a, you you basically still um, have the framework of the whole functional program, but then part of it. Uh, uh, part of the implementing hardware. Um, and that's exact, uh, and, 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 and the other part of Chisel is that is, uh, it embedded a, a lot of hardware generation uh, uh, beta into it. So, so this is kind of uh, resonate with some of the motivations from, from Berkeley at the beginning. Uh, basically, they, the, the, idea of it, the idea of it is because uh, there's limited people, right, like just like ourselves now here, a small team and the aggressive timeline and, and scalable architecture. So, so when you look at it, this seems to be a very uh, a good candidate of what we want to do. But then uh, we, we talk about actually taking it to commercialization or into taking it into actual production. Um, the tool chain of that uh, is, is rather lacking. So we also look into uh, a more conventional language, which is system Verilog. Um, uh, we uh, again we've been mostly for using Verilog now and then taking some favors of System Verilog into our design. But uh, a large part of System Verilog at this point, as all of you may know, is still not uh, synthesizable. So when, when we talk about we want to look into System Verilog, uh, we are saying we're not just saying okay we take the synthesizable part, but also the unsynthesizable part, which is mainly supporting test bench and stuff right now, and see whether we can take the advantage of that. Uh, a, a lot of that, a lot of the idea is um, based on different uh, hardware constructs that we can do structures, uh, different data types, and also some type or some level object object oriented programming. Um, the idea we want to make sure that we have object oriented programming is 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 the sense that um, if you want to be able to go from a high level of extraction to a lower level. The the how do you group how do you group pieces together is through function instead of uh, uh, hardware structure. So in order to make sure that you can have streamlined design, you will always want it to be 
uh, grouping things based on functions and object-oriented uh, programming actually comes handy from that perspective. Um, so uh, let me just quickly jump into So let me just quickly jump into uh, a, a, a simple uh, a, a comparison of the two. I right? um, think one, one of the things that some, the, the, the right hand side, the left hand side uh, <clears throat> summarize a lot of features that we want to have. Uh, parameterizations, which is uh, in, important if we want to make our uh, design more scalable or more reusable. Uh, language extension, I'm going to cover it later. Object-oriented programming, I mentioned about functional programming is similar idea that we want to make sure that we have a way to define our thing, our, our hardware, our kind of functions rather than just uh, structures. Um, the verification part, uh, and synthesizable part, I also mentioned about those part. Right now we see a much stronger uh, uh, environment and, and readiness for, for the system dialog. Versus she so 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 the <clears throat> so that's the inconvenient part that we're seeing. Um, we we do want a language that is a combination of these two, um, uh, but yes, I don't think we have that right now. Um, okay, and uh, and yet I think the the current state of the language is still not sufficient enough to do what we want to do. Like I mentioned. Uh, uh, Chiso itself, or even system dialog itself, is more just a uh, 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 hardware, still a hard le hardware level of description language. It doesn't get the type of extraction that we need to do. Uh, it's just on processor design that I mentioned. Um, so um, <clears throat> uh, um, that that includes some type of uh, more more um, so-called uh, detailed user-defined. Uh, instructions. How do we, how do we going to implement that, and uh, how do we how do we uh, describe some of the structures that that are common to to our design? So uh, so that brings to again the comparison between the Chiso and Verilog. I think Chiso itself um, uh, uh, again itself is actually a, a, a extension from Scala. So so by itself it is able to do extension much more easier. Um, and so when we look into it, uh, and actually we do an example here. So we want to do, uh, be able to describe a, a, a instruction set or ISA or processor uh, using the cheese as an extension, uh, we can actually easily do it uh, without much problem. So so this is what we, we, we are looking into when we say, okay, for the next stage, what are the language that we want to use? Um, so with the language set, I think the other part is on the uh, automating the design. And uh, and for that, this is, I don't think this is actually any really new topic uh, we talk about. Um, this is mainly on so-called the design space exploration. And to that, I think, uh, to our understanding, there are two uh, difficulties that we are facing right now. So uh, the important part is how to design, how to describe the design space. Um, and, and the difficulties lies in two parts. One is uh, when you so-called define the design space, it's not just, it just, it's just not, it, it's not just simply describing design spaces and also uh, be able to get the PPAT data or the so-called metrics data for, for, the, for each of the design points. And at this point, if we talk about some of the hardware, if you want to get, if you want to get the so-called uh, performance, power, and area timing data, it's really expensive because you need to run through the whole implementation process. Uh, and even if, even if it's not, you at least need to write the RTL out before you can run through some of the high-level uh, estimation tools like uh, 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 Spyglass or, or some of the different. Uh, High level uh, power estimation tools. I mean, you, you at least you need the uh, uh, design to be done before you can do that in, instead of actually just highly modeling uh, that or describing the design space. And the other part is the design space is, is rather limited. Uh, uh, or, or put it the other way, you, like I mentioned, you, you always need to have a uh, very detailed description of design space before you can move into some real exploration. 
So from that perspective, we're looking into different aspects to solve that. Uh, on, on the algorithm side, we're looking into different ways to actually uh, do a much more efficient design space exploration based on smaller samples and, and even uh, also have a less uh, uh, strengthening requirement on the accuracy of the model. And on the modeling side, uh, we're looking to face out, we're looking into ways on how to better model our design. And on the actual uh, uh, design generation part, we are looking into ways or, or <clears throat> on how to quickly uh, able to generate some of the so-called PPAT data. Um, um, some of the higher level, I, I, our understanding on to, uh, we talk about modeling, some of the general modeling technique, uh, the, the different ways that we are, we are trying to take advantage of, right? Um, uh, again, we are looking at different abstraction of, of the model. And oftentimes if the, if, if the model is a high level of extraction, then you can easily describe a much larger space, but the accuracy, accuracy is low. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a more, uh, <clears throat> more lower level of description of the design space, um, you, the space itself will be smaller because it takes time to describe them. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the accuracy of such description is high. So, um, so we can look into ways on how to merge this data together to give a better uh, a prediction on the specific PPAT data. Uh, the other part of the idea is, to, is about modular construction. Right? Um, the, the <clears throat> it may take time to describe the whole space again and again, but instead of describing the whole space again and again, we, we divide the space into different subparts and then describe them um, uh, on a manner or, or be able to describe the PPAT numbers in a manner that can, it can be uh, summed up together to form the uh, complete space. So um, uh, those are the two things that we are looking into. Um, and then the other part is on the algorithms. Uh, the, uh, talk about design space exploration. I think one very important part is on the benchmark. How do you, how do you define was the most optimum point. And uh, I can mention mentioning about the PPAT power uh, performance every timing. Um, so those are the numbers, but how, how, how do we uh, gauge um, what, what is more important? Uh, so we look in the algorithms firms to, to say, uh, 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 optimizing it from different, uh, from different angles. And also the benchmark itself, right? Uh, the PPAT is one thing, uh, but there's also the workload, like what are you actually running? Um, what are you actually running to give the, the, the power and, and, <clears throat> and the performance, right? Are you running some uh, just simple so-called uh, uh, off-the-shelf benchmark? Uh, uh, does, does that really correlate to the workload that we are using? Uh, is the benchmark sufficient enough? Um, but then that, that will come to the problem that you will have a whole long list of benchmarks it takes time to actually get all the data if you have a launch benchmarks and and this is time then when when some of the machine learning technique can come to come to space in or uh, in in terms of how do we sort out the best list of things that we can use to to do our benchmarking and the uh, multi-fidelity model that i kind of mentioned before on the last slide is uh, we be able to do we able to do models on different extraction and how to merge them to get to get better prediction um, okay, uh, since time is running out, so I, let, let me speed up a little. Um, so, uh, and that's the last part of, of the <clears throat> of the of, of the whole framework and picture is uh, then again on the uh, so-called hardware software partitioning requirement, and what I call the ISA definition, um, <clears throat> because um, we want, we do want to make make sure that we're able to do more uh, architectural microarchitecture innovation. Uh, the ISA itself needs to be, uh, uh, we, we now, in, our, in our opinion, needs some innovation as well. So if you look back into the um, history, uh, if you look at the uh, different compute device, uh, uh, <clears throat> going from the early days of so called mainframe, which is a really big box or, 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 or whole sets of equipment, to do computes and then you lock into mini computer, which is a much smaller piece and then to PC, uh, desktop, etc. So 
the main difference of, the, of that uh, in addition to the number, the, the, the size of the, of the equipment itself, that also lies in the fact that the business model of each of is different and then the, the number of customers they are serving is a lot different. Going from like millions of units to like 10 billions of units in, in today's mobile computing. Uh, and if you refer that to the ISA, the instruction set architecture being used in different uh, time, uh, it actually goes from a most, the mostly custom ISA, which belongs to one single company, to so-called as half standard ISA, which uh, allows like so-called x86 compatible machine to be built, um, to so-called mo mobile computing, which is a license license wise that different uh, companies can actually do their own SOCs. Um, <clears throat> and the, the important part of it is actually it allows much more different players to use the same ISA to do compa compatible devices. And, and if you look at the scales of it, it's actually the, the ISA demarcation co goes from the whole computer uh, to the PC side, which is on the chip, and then on the on, on now today's uh, mobile world, which is just on the CPU core itself. So, uh, moving forward, uh, if you want to actually uh, hit the so-called IoT era, uh, what, are, what are the ISO we are going to need? That's posed the question. And the, the part of it is actually uh, about differentiation, right? Uh, again, going back to, to the analogy that I made, the personal computing days actually differentiation comes from the machine. And embedded computing days, I call the mobile computing days, right? The differentiation comes from the SOC integration. So you are, you have different <clears throat> you have different SOCs, but the eyesight itself is still the same. But you're looking to, to today what I call the ubiquitous computing days, which we have compute device on every single piece of electronics. The differentiation, I think, needs to come from the process of customization. So the if you go back to the so-called computer architecture, right, the, this line of eyes, uh, I think, no longer sits in that uh, a solid area. It probably the ISA will change uh, uh, depending on what the device that we are working on, and we able to we want to able to, to build like insurance set extension, extension, and be able to use our core to to do close a couple accelerator to make sure that we have enough differentiation. Um, and if you look out to the world, let me just can <laughs> a look at the world. The ISA that is existing on dominant today is uh, x 6 again and on ARM, and both of them, if you look at it doesn't allow the type of uh, extension, it doesn't allow the type of flexibility we want to do. There's only so many companies that, there's only two companies or three companies in the world today that can do x86, x86 and there's only so many companies or a dozen of them that can do ARM processors. Um, and, and, and to that, um, <clears throat> the question is, uh, and there's a hype these days on a RISC-V and is it RISC-V coming to rescue? Um, and what we believe RISC-V is not just an ISA, uh, but it's all an open ecosystem and that allows open hardware development and open, uh, not just hardware, but also the software ecosystem that goes around it and also the whole, whole tool chain. Uh, the problem we see right now is there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of people using risc and and that there still lacks the type of commu commu community union. Uh, if, you, if we do an analogy of this open hardware world to the open software world, which we have this Linux kernel uh, being the mainstream of, of, of every uh, uh, well, software developers. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. This screen uh, is invisible again. Okay. Yep. Uh, is it okay now? No. Uh, let's see. Let me just quickly do it. Sorry, I apologize again. Um, what about now? I can only see the mouse. Sorry. No, what's happening? Um, Yeah, Zoom, Zoom doesn't like me every time I have a hard time playing, but um, okay. Okay, yeah. 
Is it okay now? No, okay now. Okay. Okay, so so is risk five coming to rescue? I guess uh, what I want to talk about is risk five. There's a lot of hype and there's a lot of open that's coming to it. Uh, the the problem is that if we do the the, the energy to the software ecosystem, the software open source ecosystem, uh, there's a still a lot of way to go. Like uh, say for example, if you talk about risk five IP, um, we 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 see a lot of open source risk five IP, but none of them actually take. Um, a union or take a, a, a center stage of, of everything that can have a central so-called if if I will the best thing is you have a central repository just like the Linux kernel and then everybody will contribute to one single say uh, risk 5 IP database uh, uh, and that's something we, we yet to see so so this is something that that hopefully can be improved over time um, so in, in summary um, the gains by, by advancing technology is diminishing uh, and, and, and is actually giving engineers a hard time. And in the same time, customer demands on better PPA keep pushing the envelope, right? I mean, there's harsher demand, but there's less things uh, that there's no more advanced technology that we can rely on. But then on the other hand, we see advances in, in language, algorithms, and ISA. Um, uh, that provide some type of foundation for more in, innovation, but uh, then and again, a lot still needs to be done. I think we, we, we are still, we have some foundation, but it's still far from what the utopia they were looking into. So, and and the, I think the good things about uh, we as engineers is, I think it, it's actually, there's a time, it's a time to, for us to recognize our design process. So what we see is opportunities are as big as risk. So uh, again, thanks for, and that concludes my talk and, and thanks everyone for attention. Okay, says Matthew for this, great and inspiring talk. Let's see whether we have any questions from the audience. Well, actually, uh, here's a, a reminder. If you have any following question, you can um, post it in our uh, Slack discussion group as well. Let's show in this slides, I can see it's indeed a revolutionization way for the processor design of using Chiso kind of language can improve the efficiency of course, but it may introduce some challenging from debugging perspective. I mean, if we, we get an error, how we can trace back into, into the source to see which, where we can modify our design. Uh, can you have any common on this part. Right, so, so that, that's exactly the, the dilemma that we are facing, right? So that's why I bring up the, uh, uh, when we go out and say, okay, we want to use uh, or change our database or change our tools from from the 20 years old rare lock to, to something new. Uh, we do have this comparison between system rare lock and, and I mean, it, it, and GSO, which is system rare lock being a much more, uh, um, uh, uh, popular or, or tools around or, or language around all these tools. Um, <clears throat> and, but at the end of the day, we, we believe we still want to go to Chiso because um, if we want to go, so, go for something new, the hope is later on, if it's something good, the industry is going to embrace that. So what you see is, uh, like you mentioned, I think we see a lot of problems working with Chiso right now, say one thing is even we don't we don't even even have a waveform viewer, a proper waveform viewer or, or, or a tracer for 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 debugging Chiso code, um, and not to say that we are the other parts of the chain and and right now it's pretty much like a hack because we have this uh, so called virtual tools that translate Chiso to Redlock. Um, what we see in the future is we do hope there would be. Um, uh, 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 New form of tool. Oh, hello, Matthew. I cannot hear you now.
I just want to double check it's not lying the connection problem. Yeah, no one can hear. Okay, great, thanks. Let's see whether Matthew came back soon. Um, Hi, Professor Yu. Yes, yes, yeah. Good that you Yeah, back. sorry. I think it's better. I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I just changed to change back to using the cell phone, that's probably easier. So yeah, same like, uh, we, we pretty much hope that um, in the future, the the industry or, 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 or the ecosystem there will be more support on, on cheese or native cheese or support rather than, right now it's pretty much like hack that, that changed that to fertile to cheese or the very lock and everything now, and, and, and then everyone works on very lock. I don't think that's the right way. It's, it's like you gain productivity on, on using cheese, or then, then you lose and, uh, and other uh, 50% of productivity on, 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 on the non-native non tool sets. I see. Yeah. So uh, I apologize again for, for, the, for the IT issue. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, may I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Matthew, thank you. A lovely talk. Um, um, on uh, um, the chisel and the ISA. On, on the customization, I just had a quick question. Um, so uh, classically, we're all familiar with the uh, Tensilica approach where you could customize the ISA and customize the compiler and so on. So this customization that you're talking about is kind of the next step. Is it similar to what Tensilica used to have or is it something beyond that? Um. Well, I think there are four Tesla what we call processor vendor, right? That's Tesla and then uh, I think back then that's Java and Target, uh, Lisa Tech, a whole lot. Um, a lot of them, uh, there, there are two things to them, right? Uh, one thing is um, they are not, they are not, um, uh, highly optimized for the PPA we need, right? So, so it, sometimes they, they will allow some of customization. I mean, I see, that, I see. Mm -hmm. if, if you compare that to, if you compare that to really off the shelf ARM core, yeah, they can't compete PPA wise because right. they, 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 they are very, they are built to be, they say, okay, we want it to be flexible, right? So, so PPA wise, they're going to give up. On, on, on the core part of that. Uh, but then they regain the part that they can really be customized. They can need new, add new instructions. Right. Uh, right. From our perspective, we need both. Yes, yes, we need, okay. We need, we need the PPA as well as some of the chef arm cores, but also we want it to be customizable. That's one thing. Uh, and the other part of it is, I think that even you talk about the customization, um, the, the thing that's uh, available for, for uh, Either either Tesla or or, or um, ASIP is is less than what we want. So we, we want to do things that we can have a highly customizable pipeline, um, okay. um, <clears throat> and and not just simply adding instructions. And also more and even more on the micro -architect architecture side, um, and that actually ties to the strength and PPA that we need. Right, so we want to be able to customize even small micro architecture details, um, like different queue sizes, um, different ways of organizing your caches, um, and in the same time, be able to add new instructions, new customizable instruction in a really simple way. Um, okay. So, so I think um, we 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 can borrow a lot of ideas from from adding new instructions because adding new instructions is not just to do. Uh, RTL itself, but also the tool chain we need to do um, on, on the compiler and the ID and stuff. Right, right. Uh, I think that's similar. Um, uh, but then again, I, I think we do have the challenge that uh, we, we, in terms of performance, PPA-wise, we want 
our generator tool sets or generator cores to be on par or and uh, with the tailor made stuff. So, so that's the part that 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 that, that we want to see uh, based on machine learning or, or or new types of algorithms whether we can achieve that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for the, 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 the question. Let's see whether we have any other question from the audience. Um, if no, maybe we can stop today's presentation here. Uh, we, we can also have some more discussion in the select discussion group. Thanks again for Matthew's great talk. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I. Uh, that's the end of the, our third day of the uh, AmeriCat. And uh, from the tomorrow, we will have some other very interesting and, and inspiring presentation and talk. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a good day and good night. See you.